From every mountain and valley the world over are flowers and plants of simple beauty. Some hold a natural wonder, chemicals that soothe pain and inspire euphoria. At times they've been hailed as a gift of heaven, but in the last century they've been condemned as a scourge of man. Once, marijuana, cocaine, opium, ecstasy, LSD, even heroin were perfectly legal. Today, they compel a war on drugs. Did these plants and drugs change, or did we? Drugs are menacing our society. It's like a five-hour orgasm. Used wisely can produce the greatest ecstasy that man knows. Every generation's youth have danced the night away, from the jitterbug to the twist. Part of the adventure of the youthful rite of passage often involves the use of illegal drugs, from spiked punch to marijuana and LSD. At the start of a new century, adolescents are flocking to a new illegal drug called ecstasy, sold and distributed at raves, dance parties that grew out of the culture of the drug and fostered its popularity. But my favorite drug in the whole entire world is ecstasy. Imagine if you just won $100 million in the lottery, and everyone around you has also won $100 million in the lottery. That's what it feels like to be on ecstasy, where you feel this great high, you feel everyone else is also high, everyone else is just great, you feel close to other people. Oh, it's like a five-hour orgasm. This is not about like opium where you want to go zone out and, and drop out. It's not that kind of escape. It's not let me drop out of the world and do nothing. It's let me have excitement. Let me do something wild and different. Let me enjoy this because I want to be awake and do it. I want to run around and get involved. Right on, man. Oh. Adolescents throughout history have used illegal drugs in rebelling against the prevailing social values of the day. If you look at the late 60s, drugs like LSD and psychedelics were quite popular. And I think then people were responding to the oppressiveness of America in the 1950s and the early 60s and really seeking sources of expression, really seeking to create an alternative universe, if you will. Just as LSD, marijuana, and Woodstock unite a generation, experts say ecstasy and the rave scene act as a glue for millions of savvy middle-class kids seeking an escape from the isolation, alienation, and loneliness of the modern day. For $25 to $40 a pill, ecstasy users can purchase an increased sense of intimacy. They call it the love drug, and it's not really about that at these crowds. It's not about sex. It's about family and being close and being together. That sense of emotional well-being is nothing more than a chemical reaction inside the brain. Ecstasy stimulates the discharge of serotonin, which affects mood, energy, and emotion. Normally what happens, a little bit of serotonin gets released at a time. And in fact, uh, antidepressants such as Prozac and uh, Zoloft and Paxil also act on serotonin. What ecstasy basically does is it takes serotonin uh, and releases it all at once. And the next nerve gets all the serotonin and just goes berserk, basically. Intimacy, empathy, openness. The chemical compound that inspires these feelings is methylene dioxymethamphetamine, or MDMA. Though not physically addictive, it could cause psychological dependence. An average 100 milligram dose lasts between six to 10 hours. The chemical precursor to the party drug of the 90s is patented by German pharmaceutical giant Merck. 
when Merck patented it, it was just uh, one of a number of drugs, just that they thought may have other drugs that could be developed from it at some point in the future that might have effects on the brain. But this is World War I, and the Germans must focus on drugs for the war effort. With Germany's defeat, MDMA and every other patented drug is turned over to the Allies as a spoil of war. Its existence is lost from memory until the Cold War compels the Pentagon to re-examine its potential for national defense. In 1953, the U.S. Army began to experiment with ecstasy in animals, dogs, guinea pigs, monkeys, to see whether it might have use in chemical warfare. Again, the drug was then dropped for a while. The love drug does nothing of use for war, but the compound still exists. Now realize at that time, the chemical had been synthesized, uh, but it had not been produced into a pharmaceutical product. So it existed in the books. Someone could look it up and make it, synthesize it, but no company was producing it because it had no medicinal use. No known use. But what if the drug's empathic qualities could transform the way people relate to each other? In 1977, Alexander Shulgin, a medicinal chemist in California, synthesizes the compound and introduces it to local psychotherapists. Psychotherapists in the 70s and 80s really latched onto this. It was not illegal then, it was just a, a chemical substance that existed in society. Uh, and a lot of psychotherapists, particularly out in the West, uh, used this in, a, in very valuable uh, sessions to, to help their patients. And apparently, at least from the anecdotal information, uh, it was very, very successful. Often it was used in marriage counseling and marriage therapy, in which members of a couple would have trouble talking to each other, and ecstasy made them feel close to each other, made them trust each other more, and so therapists began to use it and advocate its use. In the psychotherapeutic community, MDMA is called empathy. Its effect is likened to a year of therapy in six hours. Had MDMA not strayed from that community and that use, it might have remained legal, but beyond the therapist's office, it becomes wildly popular. And that is the beginning of the end for the legal use of ecstasy. Hooked, illegal drugs, and how they got that way will return in a moment. What ecstasy does for me is basically every breath I take, I makes me. It makes my teeth chatter, my eyes flutter, I mean, I'm just like, Ooh. In the late 70s, empathy becomes ecstasy when it jumps from the therapist's office to the party scene. A therapeutic user in Texas sees its recreational potential and arranges for a local chemist to make it, then markets it to local bars. So they would go into clubs in Dallas and Austin, elsewhere in Texas, and have ecstasy nights or have ecstasy bars or ecstasy clubs. And you can buy it over the counter in a paper cup. And it was legal. In some bars, it outsells alcohol. But its excessive, unsupervised use outside of a clinical setting becomes its downfall. There were a lot of incidents where young people were uh, overdosing. Um, there were a couple of deaths, but it's still arguable as to whether it was caused by ecstasy or not. And just the general sense of use, that more and more people are using it in this party scene and having a good time. But having a good time is the result of serotonin flooding the brain. And that dramatic release is what makes ecstasy potentially dangerous. The problem is that cells, when they dump all that serotonin, then often uh, degenerate. Parts of the cells die, and when they grow back, they grow back more haphazardly. You may be interfering with memory, you may be interfering with depression, you may be interfering with a whole host of things that are important in normal functioning. The agony begins when the ecstasy wears off. After a night of partying and a day to sleep it off, the brain is left with very little serotonin. A weekend of ecstasy can result in a phenomenon called Suicide Tuesday, as described in the diary of this 19-year-old female. At this moment, I found myself crashing. Things are really hitting and hurting me now, and I'm scared to death. 
I find myself so depressed. I can't escape this sadness, this need to live in a false reality. I feel so empty. But when I'm on E, I feel so incredible. More can go wrong than just feeling blue. Overstimulated, overheated, and feeling too good to notice. A small number of ecstasy users have literally danced themselves to death. It opens the door to dehydration. If you don't hydrate and drink enough water constantly during this time, body temperature soars up to 107, your brain fries, literally, and they die. In 1982, Texas Senator Lloyd Benson brings awareness of excessive ecstasy use to Washington and the Drug Enforcement Agency. Under the authority of the 1970 Controlled Substances Act, ecstasy is immediately placed on an emergency ban. Overnight, the drug becomes illegal. Possession is a crime. Under this law, the emergency ban expires two years later. And so, in 1984, the DEA began a series of hearings to see whether the drug should be illegal or not, and how it should be made illegal. At the hearings, the key question is this. Can ecstasy be used medicinally, or should it be banned outright? Supporters of the drug believe it could be beneficial, but would like to research it further. The house but I think the DEA in some ways was surprised that suddenly therapists came forth and saying, well, in fact, that they're using the drug and that it is, in their minds, a useful tool in therapy. Uh, what came to be an issue was what the definition of medical acceptable use is. And on the one hand, you had therapists saying they were using the drug and that it was useful. On the other hand, you had scientists saying, well, but it's not meeting the definition of being scientifically proven to be useful and society. This is Advocates story. argue to keep the drug legal for two reasons. First, they believe it is useful in therapy. Second, making it illegal would ban all future research. Without research, there can be no study of the drug's effects. Opponents believe the drug is dangerous and ironically cite the lack of MDMA research to justify a ban. After an official finding, the Drug Enforcement Administration overrules the judge. The administrative law judge that was overseeing the hearings that were held to determine if ecstasy should be made illegal, or MDMA, um, didn't think it should be. And he was overruled by the federal government, and it was banned. We've got the transcripts. He couldn't find any reason, why, and it was a Schedule One. When the government categorizes the drug as Schedule One, it is judged to have a, quote, high potential for abuse and no medical use. As a Schedule One drug, ecstasy is outlawed from further testing. This is the first time a specific act of Congress is not required to make a drug illegal. In the early part of the 20th century, heroin, cocaine, and marijuana are legal drugs too. In spite of their dangers, Congress is unable to ban them because that is seen as a violation of the Constitution's assignment of police powers to individual states. But that changes when a fearful public demands Congress to act. They do, basing the first federal drug laws on taxation. By 1984, when ecstasy is banned, society's attitude towards drugs and the Constitution has changed. The key thing to watch in drug use is where is the middle class? If the middle class is deep into drug use, you'll find that the laws are not so severe. If the middle class is out of it, can't understand why anyone would take drugs, the laws are going to get very severe against those who do use it. So how is ecstasy banned without an act of Congress? The answer belongs to a modern policy that emerges out of another drug in another time, LSD. The drug that some believe will change the consciousness of America does more to change American drug laws and the way legal drugs become illegal. Nineteen sixty-eight, the summer of love. LSD use is at its height. 
Within two years, possession...